happening y'all thanks for tuning in to the crash bang boom podcast my guest today is drum and powerhouse rick smith of one of my absolute favorite bands torch for 12 plus years torch has been carving out their own brand of sludgy melodic power pop and with rick's driving force that is sometimes slow and spacious frenetic and explosive or even outright dancey rick always seems to be in the right place at the right time we cover his many projects, side jobs, and what has inspired him to continue his pursuit of music throughout the years. You'll even get a little comedic side commentary from vocalist Steve Brooks. So check it out, y'all. Crash Bang Boom! Smith, thanks for sitting down with me, my man. No problem. So uh, tell me something here, man. You're here with Whores and Red Fang. Pretty awesome bill. Uh, killer show that I saw Saturday night at the Williamsburg Music Hall. Tonight you're at the Mercury Lounge here in the Lower East Side. Uh, how's the tour been going, and um, how much more do you have to go? Tour's been awesome. Uh, we did Before this tour, we did um, a full month in, the, in Europe with Red Fang. So awesome. This tour kind of feels like a continuation of the last one, but we've got whores with us on the, the U.S. leg, and uh, they're an awesome band, and, and uh, tour's been good so far. Everything's been awesome, and it's it's a lot colder on this tour than it was on the last one, and yeah. it seems like it's just going to keep getting colder. So besides the weather, everything's pretty awesome. Nice. Did you have any particular places in Europe that uh, were awesome this past time or that you always look forward to and go in there? I'd say... None of them. They all sucked. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, man, I'm trying to think. I feel like it's one of those things that I, when I get put on the spot, I can't remember. Steve, what is one of your favorite places to play in Europe? Oh, am I in this interview? <laughs> um, uh, I would say Madrid. Spain. Spain, for sure. Spain's awesome. Gotcha. We didn't play Spain on the last trip, though. Oh, gotcha. Um, I mean, Berlin's always fun. Yeah. Um, did you find the uh, people in Berlin, or at least when I was there, I've said this before, they're very stoic and kind of a little almost socially awkward, at least for first for myself, I guess. I, I got hushed a lot, like I was a, this loud, obnoxious southerner, maybe I am. I just expected to be like arm wrestling and pounding beers, and like I expected my expectation uh, in Berlin, in particular. Yeah. I don't know. I guess yeah, I had a different experience. Man, I asked that, man. Really? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel I, feel, I think a lot of German, German people are kind of like that. They can come off kind of serious, maybe, yeah. like, maybe a little stiff, you know, really but honest too. they're very brutally honest. honest. Yeah. Yeah. They, they like to tell us when we suck, if they think we suck. Right. You know, hey, you know, like last time I saw you, you were pretty shit. This time, not so shit. <laughs> That's or, or the other way around. exactly. That sounds about right, man. You have what another couple of weeks? You're thinking on on this tour? Yeah, we've got we've got like twelve more shows. Nice. I think. So, um, we got twelve shows, and then after this, we'll be taking a break and writing. How is? Uh, I I was confused at first, not knowing. Uh, I saw Jonathan, your bass player, mm -hmm. uh, playing guitar, and I thought that I was I was just confused for a second there, and then I realized that he had moved over to guitar, and that you had a new bass player. How's uh, the new bass player working in? 
he's awesome. He's kind of been in our band in some form in the past. He toured when he toured as a drummer. Oh, okay. Torch when I couldn't do a tour in Europe. Really? Early on, yeah. Multi instrumentalist. Yeah, yeah. He plays everything, and then um, he also filled in for me. I had a death in the family. I had to fly home for, and he filled in for me on like a day's notice. Wow. Flew up to New York. And played down the East Coast, and that was finishing uh, our tour with High on Fire in 2010. Wow! So he's been in the band. He's he's basically our dude. Like he jumps in when we need him to, and he's kind of always been that dude for us. And and uh, I've I've always wanted him in the band. Mm-hmm. He's a great songwriter, and he's an awesome player. Yeah, he's a very musical player. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I mean, all he does is write music. I mean, when he's home, all he does is write and write and write. So uh, it's he's he's pretty much like the dude that we've been looking for. I think as far as like you know, someone who's gonna come to the table with a lot of ideas and like have something to offer. So um, so far, it's good playing with him. We had to get used to playing with him a little because he plays a lot different than John. Mm-hmm. Obviously, John moving to guitar, he's been you know fine tuning it as we go. Right. So it's you know it's it's a change. It's the dynamics a little bit different, and we're, we've been getting used to it. But as as tour's been going on, it's been getting a lot better. As a spectator, I don't know that I have had like I could tell any discernible difference necessarily. It all just it sounded fucking good to me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, all right, well, that, see, that's good. I mean, that's that's been the general consensus so far. So yeah, a lot of our friends, you know, are pretty psyched about it, and then cool. especially friends that are real close with us. If they're real close with us, they probably already know Eric. Right. So um, they're excited. So Torch has been a, been a band ten years. You going on a decade plus? Yeah, we uh, we were we started in two thousand four, so it's been this will be year number twelve. I guess. Wow. Yeah. No shit. So it's been it's been a little while. Like I, in two thousand fourteen, we did a ten year anniversary tour mm-hmm. and played a bunch of songs on that tour uh, that we don't play ever. We right. Basically, uh, brought, like kind of went through our back catalog and pulled out a lot of like weird rarities and cool stuff like that and uh after that it was kind of a way to sort of give some closure to maybe like old older material so we sure. can continue working on new stuff and um i know andy Lowe that did our first record has been wanting to do like a 10-year anniversary you know edition special edition of the self-titled record cool. but um just for various reasons we didn't really think that that record is good definitive uh i guess release for us you know yeah, yeah. I, I would say we really hit our stride at meanderthal yeah and that's an incredible record so i think that's when we really figured out who we who we are as songwriters or something right um so i mean maybe we, we talked like maybe when that hits 10 years we'll do like some kind of nice deluxe version with bonus material and stuff but it is yeah time's flying so <laughs> Yeah. Where is uh now? Where's your bass player based out of? Because I know y'all are kind of spread out. You're in Miami. I'm in Miami, and the bass player's in Miami. Okay. So two are in Miami, two are in LA. Okay. So gotcha. How does that work? Uh, I guess rehearsal and or writing wise, is there file sharing that leads up to it, or do y'all just wait I think to? That's gonna well, happen in the future. well, Steve, if you're gonna talk in this interview, you better come closer. Well, I don't want to get my sickness all over the place. Well, sh- <laughs> I. I mean, Steve. Steve's always recording ideas and sending stuff. You know. Uh-huh. Uh huh sending stuff to us like just single riffs and or sometimes you know a couple riffs together nice um john records a lot of stuff on his own time like mm-hmm. riffs and ideas as well and then eric records tons and tons of stuff uh, okay he's, he's already got like 16 full demo wow songs that are just like we can pick and choose what things we think are cool from that's awesome so um me and eric will be able to get together a lot which is cool yeah i write really well with eric and we get together and i've i I mean i started playing music with him so wow really yeah like he's the first guy i ever jammed with that's amazing did y'all did you did you meet him in high school or prior to that i actually met him before that i met him in elementary school oh Um, wow when i met when i met eric actually his i saw his it was sandbox right at the no sandbox was, at the no, park no, i think no. so let's was, go ahead and make that the story that's a good story <laughs> it was his uh, i saw him play in a band actually when i was in elementary school like he Bullshit. was how old was he he had to have been in like the sixth grade oh, okay so he's a little older than you he's like uh, i thought you were saying i, I was like oh my god he's he playing was, in a band in elementary school yeah he was he was one grade ahead of me wow so he was in the sixth grade and i saw him playing a band with his younger brother brian who was in my grade wow and then and their adopted brother Josea, who's a good friend of ours okay um and 
and Eric's dad was playing drums. So Eric was playing bass and singing, and they were they were doing Metallica covers and everything. Um, and it was the first it was the first kids my age, and I was into rock and roll at the time, but it was the first kids my age that I had seen that had long hair mm-hmm. and you know band t shirts and. Um, and, and could actually play. I mean, the the level of playing, like mm-hmm. the skill, the skill level was already pretty high. And um, through middle school, I didn't pick up. I didn't really pick up drums in middle school. I wanted to play drums, but mm-hmm. it just didn't really seem like something that could ever really happen. Mostly due to just financial reasons. Um, so you didn't grow up in a musical household where you had instruments no, or no. even a drum set or anything like that. Uh, no, I grew up in a single. <laughs> I grew up with. Uh, with a single mother, you yeah. know, raising me and my brother in, in a super tiny apartment, the three of us living together. Gotcha. And uh, so there was no room for drums. Yeah. My mom didn't necessarily want me to play drums either. <laughs> Bad. You know, and, uh, and I mean, I really wanted to, but it just didn't seem realistic to, yeah. like, you know, where was I even going to have drums anyway? So my, you know, through middle school, Eric was in a band called Enemy Against Enemy. Mm-hmm. They were kind of like a hardcore band mm-hmm. with, uh, with, his adopted brother, our friend Manny, and our friend David, and they, once they started playing shows, they started playing places down on South Beach, like the South Beach Pub, and like, um, I mean, they were kids, but they would get on gigs, and they, they could actually play, so um, I, I was kind of the roadie, mm-hmm. I, I kind of started off as a roadie, yeah. I was kind of just hanging out with the band, helping them load their stuff in and out, so I could catch rides to shows and see, see stuff, and um, over... For a long period of time, I started kind of jamming in their, jamming on the drums in their garage where mm-hmm. they practice, and uh, the guy who played uh, bass with them, my good friend David Miller, he's like an old friend of me and Eric's, uh, definitely like in our small circle of like friends, musicians we grew up with. He, he start he kind of took a chance on me and started like p- playing with me and was kind of like you know we should start a project or start a couple projects and you know try to do some stuff so i started playing drums with him doing like various you know bands and things and how old were you at that point when you first started s- kind of playing when i first started really playing i'd say i was i was in the ninth grade I okay was like i was i started like kind of messing around on a drum kit i could actually i picked it up pretty quick i'd say mm-hmm. like just getting on the drums i could play some simple beats right with, without even having to really think about it mm-hmm. i think a lot of it was just watching really watching eric play because eric was already very <laughs> musical in his playing as mm-hmm. a drummer because he was the drummer in in their band so i grew up watching him play drums i kind of knew him i kind of knew him as a a drummer more than a bass player in the beginning and then um at some point i started jamming with eric too like once i started playing drums and they saw that i could actually kind of play started jamming with eric and and he was playing bass and we you know we had bands in high school and stuff that we played with and and uh it wasn't it wasn't until but it wasn't until like uh Probably it was two thousand. Well, yeah, two thousand four when I met Steve for the first time. I was nineteen, and did you see Floor play or how it was the? Were you aware of or? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we were all big Floor fans actually. Okay. So well, I thought I was trying out for Floor. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, initially that's what I thought. And, you know, that was that was Andy Lowe who was putting out the first Torch record was actually trying to put out the Floor record. Okay. You know, and. Um, so I was excited to, to jam with them. You yeah. Know, I mean, I was super pumped. I'm 19 years old. And, of course. You know, I had talked to Steve on the phone, and he had talked about, you know, before I met him, we had had a conversation over the phone, and he was telling me that, you, you know, he wanted to get out and tour and do stuff. So I was super excited about it. Um, I honestly probably wasn't the right drummer at the time if it would have been floor. You know, I couldn't really play slow. I, I, you were the right drummer, though. Yeah, I mean, I ended up being the right drummer. Yeah, you know, in the long run, it, it ended up it ended up changing the way we like we to what what Torch ended up sounding like. Right, probably had something to do with the fact that that I could play fast, and I think Steve liked to utilize it. You know, yeah, yeah, I could see that. That was one of the things I was going to ask you. I guess at the beginning of of the formation of Torch was the idea to have sort of the sludgier, low end nature of floor and have more melody and more harmonies and all that. Was that the idea? Was it was it a concept? I mean, I just said- like I just played guitar like I had a certain sound that I enjoyed playing guitar and so it was like heavy but I also wanted to do other things I wanted it to be free to kind of open but I, I also wanted to play in a power pop band too so I feel like, like you got a little bit of that with Torch all that I would th- yeah. feel like so it's not limited and it was it was cool playing with a drummer that could do different things and who was open to it 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, in the way the way I start the way I listened to music changed a lot when I started jamming with Steve and Juan. Okay. You know, like Steve and Juan both liked a lot of music that I hadn't been exposed to at that time in my life. So, it ch- changed the way I listen to music, changed the way I write, like approach writing music with mm-hmm. bands. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's just a, like any band. I guess it's just like a big growing experience. You know, like yeah. you, things you're naturally going to change over time, and you know, your sound will evolve and things. You know, but um. But I'd say uh, the, the a lot of the drumming in Torch is pretty simple. You know, I'd like to keep it pretty simple for the most part. You know, yeah. but but try to keep effective. It cr- yeah, 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 powerful and creative. You know, uh, without being too flashy or you know technical. Um, it almost sounds like to me. Are you a Devo fan? Yeah. yeah. I've always thought you kind of sounded a little bit like John Bonham and like some sort of Devo punk rock thing going on. Kind of minimalistic. To a certain extent, but powerful, you know? Yeah. And trying to get people to move, you know? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, that that's a good way to put it, for sure. Yeah, I mean, nice. I grew up in metal, you know, like death yeah. metal and, and grindcore and all this. Are you playing, like, double bass in the whole thing? Yeah, 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 no for shit. sure. I, I play in some metal bands and stuff, too. Doing oh, cool. doing blast beat, double bass, drumming no and shit. stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a totally different thing, but, I mean, I don't do any, like, technical death metal stuff. I just yeah. do, like, really raw yeah. kind of primitive stuff you know <laughs> yeah. um but that's where i came from initially you know right and i mean steve grew up in metal too mm-hmm. you know, he grew up in a whole generation before me you know seeing shows in the late 80s early 90s and um you know well i was I, talking to you briefly about it as well uh you had mentioned how challenging it was because you said you played some gigs with floor right yeah well <laughs> we you, right recently henry couldn't play a couple of gigs and um, I played with them in Athens, Georgia, and it was super hard. Just the the minimalistic but slow aspect of it, or you know, I mean, I know the songs. The right. crazy thing is, like, I know this. It's well, he Steve says Steve says will say it was easy, but then again, they also played the night before with a different drummer too. You know, oh wow, who, who maybe mentally may have been a little less prepared, and also maybe is like a little more far removed well, I mean, from. Provides like some grindcore with like noise and stuff. Uh-huh. And that was sick. <laughs> yeah, they had they had uh, our buddy Chris Moore. Are you familiar with Chris Moore? Uh-uh. He played. He was like the drummer for Magruder Grind oh, cool. in the early days. Oh wow! The founding okay. drummer for Magruder Grind, and like yeah. he plays in a uh, DOC and Coke Bus. He plays for Repulsion now. Okay. Yeah, he's an awesome drummer. Awesome drummer, and he's a big floor fan. So it was, cool. cool. It was uh, learned, super cool. He learned like eleven songs in like two hours or something like that. Jesus. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it was fucking awesome that we were able to to do it. Nice. Yeah, but playing but playing the floor songs, it 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 was harder than I thought it would be. You know, I really felt like I had a a, a grip on the songs and I knew the songs well enough. And then playing them, Henry just plays. Henry's got a super unique way of playing. So actually trying to get in that into that space and allow the right amount of space to. Mm-hmm. Because really, that's what it is. Like floor, it's like all the space and right. everything, you know. So it's kind of like it, it felt if it, it felt more, yeah, it felt awkward for me to play it. I bet more awkward than I thought it would. Like right. you know, air drumming to it is one thing, and then when I had to get behind the drums, and actually, actually lay feel into, the time, lay into that. it, and like allow the space to happen, mm-hmm. it was a lot harder than than I had anticipated. So. I mean, I already I already have a huge amount of respect for Henry as a drummer because I right. think he's super creative, and a lot of my style with Torch is definitely based off of things I've learned watching him play. Yeah. Um, and listening, um, he's got a really cool sort of punctuating, powerful sound, you know. Mm-hmm. And he also has this sort of uh, groove or movement, like the way his drum, like the way he makes the songs move. It's sort of like. Uh, like it's slow but it never loses the bounce Mm -hmm. he's just got a really cool timing you know right right. and um and that's one of those things that's that's nearly impossible to replicate like a feel like that especially sort of a a, maybe a semi uh, any kind of unorthodox even feel that isn't you know completely based straight off of a of a of a click track for instance where you can map it out where it's like oh you actually it's i find that he's i I don't know how he's definitely he's definitely one of the He's definitely got one of the most unique feels that uh-huh. I, of uh, any drummer I know. You know, I mean, even it's the way he appro- the way, it's just the way he approaches stuff, and like uh, it's just some a lot of it's too probably like his influences, stuff he listens yeah. to. You know, I mean, he listens to a lot of different kind of music, sure, and a lot of stuff that people probably wouldn't expect. Um, so you know, but I definitely base a, like 
think the way I play certain parts, especially in Torch, like I base off of watching him play or like floor, you know. Right. Um, you know, because yeah, you got uh, especially like off of Restarter. Uh, there are some songs that are pretty fucking slow, I would say. And you're playing, I, I you sound great playing them live. I'm not good at playing slow, uh, so I'm always fascinated by that. Yeah, it's all. It's always harder to do that than to play fast. It's harder to balance the sim. It's hard. It's harder to balance the symbols from like right spinning out of control or like <laughs> something. You know, when you're playing real slow, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's. I mean, there's a there's a lot of reasons it's hard to play slow, and I mean, I underestimated playing slow when I first joined oh, this yeah. band. You know, um, and then I got really into playing slow. And then I kind of only wanted to play slow <laughs> really? once I got into it and started feeling like I was kind of like mm -hmm. developing a, like some kind of feel you right. know, for it. Because, I mean, even like I listen to the first Torch stuff the, mm -hmm. and it sounds super stiff to me compared to how I play now. Uh -huh. you know? But it was also I was sort of forcing something that I didn't really know what I was doing, maybe. Right. Um, but, I mean, the only way to learn is to just jump in the fire and figure it out. Exactly. You know, so we uh, so I did. And. I think, I think uh, playing playing slow has actually helped me a lot as a drummer as far as learning how to relax too. You have to, yeah. You know, yeah. You have to you have to be relaxed, yeah, to be able to sort of feel it. Um, playing fast all those years and like punk bands, grindcore bands, whatever kind of bands, it's easy to stiffen up when you're playing totally. fast. Totally, yeah. So, it's um, more about playing really on top of it and just kind of keeping the truck, to the train, a, a chugging. Right, right. As opposed to sort of giving the space in between that and yeah, totally, the whole totally. feel aspect of playing, especially really slow stuff like we're talking about. Yeah, and it's it's you know, it, it's cool. I mean, I, the the I guess the biggest compliment somebody could ever give me would be would be that what I do is different than yeah. what's already happening out sure. there in some way or another. You know, yeah, yeah. somebody can recognize that maybe my style is like unique in some way, you know. I mean, sure. that's how I felt about Henry. So it's and you know, occasionally if someone says that to me, it's it's pretty much the highest compliment I could get. Um Nice. And um a, a lot of it is just like music music I listen to I, with Torch, I'm like every Torch song not I, I wouldn't say every song because some stuff Steve just plays a riff and like I just have an idea for it right. but like there's plenty of stuff where I'm like where Steve's ridden around my drums With the slower stuff, do you feel it's something that I've noticed that it, definitely the slower the music gets or the spacier it gets, the bigger the drums uh, sh should be, and it also makes it easier to play slower with bigger drums and bigger cymbals and just bigger noises. Yeah. You kind of have to give them their space. It forces you to give that sonic space a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was playing a 20 inch, uh, 26 inch kick drum for a while, and uh, you know, the torch stuff, it's kind of like a. Uh, there's a lot of variety. Some of it's real fast. Yeah. Some of it I have to be playing a lot of constant kick drum real fast. And the 26 inch drum was just becoming a big pain in the ass. I hear you. So, yeah, I downsized back to 24. 24 by 14. I, yeah, I started playing 24s when I started playing with Torch. Okay. And um, that was and, that red kit you played forever. Yeah, yeah. And before that, I had a red Vistalite as well. Oh, cool. So I had a red Vistalite. I had the red Pearl BLX kit with the 15 inch rack tom. Then I had um, after that was when I got the 26 inch. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, that was a CNC custom kit. And you're playing a, a, an 80s. Everybody makes fun of me because I say Yamaha. They're like, no, it's supposed to be Yamaha. <laughs> they want me to say it like in the proper Japanese. You but, say you say Louisiana style. <laughs> yeah. Yamaha. Yeah. I mean, that sounds more exciting to me, at least. Yeah. Uh, maybe if I had like a sword of some kind, then I could do the other pronunciation. But I'm yeah, I'll, I'll stick. I'll stick with Yamaha. Uh, but what what era is that that you're playing again? Uh, the the kit I'm playing right now is a 1980. Oh, cool. Uh, recording custom. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it's the pre-recording custom. I guess they're called the 9000. 
Nice. And you're playing, uh, did you scale down? Were you, were you previously playing three symbols? You're just playing two now? Yeah, I'm just playing two. I was, pl I was playing three at some point in time. Um, where is that? Were you two rides and one crash or one ride? It was two crashes. It was two crashes and a ride. Now you're just playing a ride and a crash. Yeah. 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 That's it. I mean, I just, I found like a, I, I basically found like a symbol setup. Two symbols I think sound good together, and I, I honestly can can't remember when this the change happened, but I'm always adding and subtracting from my kids through the years, right. like going through old pictures of tour, like the way it's set up, the way the symbols are set up. Everything's always totally different. I'm always trying to find something easy but ha i'll be able to make all the sound that i need to make out right. of it so i think like this is probably my ideal setup it's just a set of hi-hats one crash one ride and uh and you know uh four piece kit i guess 12 years into it like we said what uh what has kept you one interested and in, and in inspired to keep doing it uh throughout all these years and uh two what do you do in your downtime so it's a two-part question okay um What's kept, uh, what's kept me interested is just being a fan of music for sure. Like, I'm I'm always listening to music. Yeah. No, like pretty much no matter what. So, I'd say listening to music would probably be the number one thing that keeps me motivated. You know, I'm always hearing something new that I've never heard, and um, and I'm always just finding good songs. Like, good songwriting yeah. gets gets me off, man. I like it. I are there any I, particular like new bands, modern bands that you that you like, uh, or older bands that you revisited that you that you dig in or Yeah, I really love um well you know it, well it all depends because like I listen to so much different stuff yeah. and like I mean I I listen to a lot of electronic music even, you yeah. know, so I feel like electronic music influences me as well. I really love like a lot of Chicago footwork, juke music. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with any of that no, stuff? No. It's super cool. It's um it it's sort it's a dance or it's like a it's pretty much like a dance culture kind of underground dance culture mm -hmm. it, it it's all based around dance battling mm -hmm. and um the DJs basically they they cut up hip hop tracks and stuff and uh some of them make their own tracks and uh with NPCs and you know turntables whatever but it's very tripped out it's kind of psychedelic really repetitive and the the pattern like the all the drum patterns are kind of a little off or something you know just, there, yeah, yeah. There, there's just there, there's there's a unique feel that's what mm -hmm. i like about it it's like first time i heard the music i'd never heard music that felt that way it was right. like just kind of tweaked out you know yeah. um <laughs> and then and then when i saw the dance that goes along with it it's mm -hmm. like super fast footwork dancing and that that's inspiring too i mean i love dance i think dance is awesome and goes along with music i mean everything from like 80s hardcore punk dancing at shows right. to like you know um uh, any any kind of like you know uh, New Orleans bounce stuff you know right like, right again okay. saw New Orleans bounce show and it changed my whole changed everything man honestly. was that on your crazy uh, your crazy rager that you had down in New Orleans in, no 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 it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the the first time I saw the bounce stuff was at South by Southwest you know I mean I was familiar with it like I knew yeah, about yeah. it a little bit but I think to be at the show and and have the beat blasting real loud and uh -huh. everybody dancing and everybody having a good time like I, the energy is awesome so. Um, just a big fan of like vibing on energy that mm -hmm. music creates. So I think like dance can do a lot as far as um, drive, really driving that energy and driving sure. the point across. You know, kind of yeah. it, it's it's expressive, and it could also be really energetic. You know, I I, I definitely dig it. But I mean, a, a lot of electronic music. I, I saw Venetian snares and that that was awesome i mean it was like full-on mosh pit everyone's going crazy right. you know and in a dark room with like blinding lights flashing in your face i mean what a rush you know? yeah <laughs> you know? uh just you know tons of drum sequences and patterns coming at you a million miles an hour yeah. constantly changing but still somehow finding some kind of groove and hitting you hard in the right spots like mm -hmm. you know it's cool I, it's kind of like going on a roller coaster you just kind of have to let go and like let it take you for the ride you yeah. know so I, I like that electronic music's very um, endless as far as the possibilities. Sure. I mean, all music is endless as far as possibilities. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it's just sometimes in rock and roll, uh, you, you you become a little jaded when you see bands all the time, right. and you just don't see enough people trying to do something mm -hmm. different. You see too many people trying to just purely emulate something that's already happened. You know, I try to get my kicks from electronic music or a lot of experimental music. Mm -hmm. Listen to a lot of experimental and industrial noise music nice. just because that stuff's unpredictable to me you know I, right. I can put it on and sometimes get that same disconnect i had as a kid when you listen to music and you don't understand what a band mm -hmm. 
is really right. it's just this magical thing and you know right. there's drums bass and guitars but before you could really pick out what each individual instrument's playing mm -hmm. it's just this rocking barrage of noise hitting you and, and it's it's this very magical special thing and you know a lot of people that aren't musicians who are just fans of music can still listen to music that way and all, mm -hmm. you know they they're the least jaded people of all you know and they right. because they they're just purely listening and they're not judging or critiquing a performance or yeah. a specific drum sound on a record or something you know right. they're like they're listening because it's just it's music you know yeah so i'm i hadn't felt I, I think being in a touring band and being a musician you start getting a little critical even if you don't want to be oh absolutely when you're you put stuff on and you just immediately start hearing shit i mean there's certain beats that drummers <laughs> will play and i turn it off i'm like i hate that beat I'm done you know it's like they went they went there not right. happening for me you know um that's funny and but but what i liked about experimental music when i really started getting getting into it about i started really getting into experimental music right around the time i met steve too you know yeah. so like 12 10 12 years ago um it, it i liked that i didn't know what i was listening to yeah like i couldn't tell what was making certain sounds on these recordings and that was it was it was more about the vibe of the recording and mm. not me sitting and analyzing what somebody's actually doing to make that you know and that that was kind of cool that changed my perspective a lot on making music and even with this band i mean i try to incorporate as much as i can of stuff i've learned from listening to that kind of stuff you know so um i can sneak it in once in a while there's definitely some like industrial influenced drum stuff in different torch right. songs you know like uh song we did on the boris split was like super influenced by you know early industrial stuff like test department and uh -huh. also stuff like killing joke and uh you know, so I, I try to incorporate the like all everything I listen to, you know, in this band. You know, there's definitely like times where I'm like, oh, man, I really want to play a beat like this, or I want to do like Noi, like some you know Kraut Rock jam or right, something, right. and like play the same beat over and over yeah, for ten yeah. minutes. Like I want to do that. I in feel a song. like I started hearing more of that on like uh, Harmonicraft, like the, that that for, concept for sure. We, we 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 really did it. I think we really first did it in um, songs for singles. The last yeah, song yeah, on yeah. songs for singles yeah. was like I. I, me and Steve were pretty much talking about doing stuff like that and that was our first real attempt at it then yeah Harmonicraft had some stuff like that yeah. Restarter the song Restarter is kind of like that too you know just really monotonous repetitive mm -hmm. it's not about the drums at all you right. know at all yeah. you know the, it, it, it's basically just like super stripped down yeah. and more about letting these guys build a song right. and try to make it as linear and driving as possible without yeah. it ever falling apart or yeah, feeling yeah. like it's slow, slowing down. In your in your off time, do you generally just keep playing music? And at, at which point did you did that just become full time? Has it been that way for quite some time? Did you have to had do bullshit odd jobs in between at some point? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, what was the worst odd job you ever did? Damn. Um, I think some of the jobs I had, I I worked. I've I've actually had some all right jobs, you know. Yeah. I, like spent some time at a record store. Oh cool. I also did like. A, I also worked at a on a river doing yeah. kayak tours, so and renting kayaks, so that was super chill. That sounds um, awesome. I also I worked at a place called Space Taco, <laughs> really? Internet Cafe slash Taco Shop. That <laughs> that kind of sucked. 
I, I worked at multiple scuba diving shops. Worked really? on some boats and stuff. Are you a certified scuba diver? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That, that was my dad's profession. He was like... Awesome. My, my dad was a, uh, a pioneering... He, he was like a pioneering member of the South Florida commercial scuba diving community. Oh, cool. Um, he was a big part of the artificial reef program down there. Nice. Uh, so, I mean, I grew up around that, basically. And, and my awesome. first job is like how I basically could afford my first cymbals and hardware and gear that, you know, uh, my uncle, my mom helped me get a drum kit eventually when I was in high school and then started saving up for, they were just like, oh, now you got to work and buy your own cymbals and <laughs> right. stands and everything else, you know? So I, at around that time I was working in dive shops. Yeah. yeah. So that's cool. Working man. in dive shops, getting certified that, that year was a year I got certified, had to get a bunch of different certifications because my dad was really like on top of me making sure I could be certified for like deep water, di like open right. water, uh, cave diving, like every yeah. kind of certification I, I could have got, I did. Plus I had to do like CPR training. I mean, he wanted me to be full, you know, full on scuba master. That's well, do you, you know. still do it pretty frequently when you have time? I haven't, I haven't gone diving about 10, I would say almost 10 years. Really? Um, it's been a really long time. Do you uh, have to, are your certifications, are they still valid? Do they lapse after a certain period? To tell you the truth, I don't really know. I'm not 100% sure, my, but I have an older brother who, he he followed in my dad's footsteps way more, and he he ended up he's competed in like world world uh championship for free diving and stuff wow, like that. Wow, that's you know crazy. I mean? He diving, could be underwater Jesus. for four or five minutes. That's just crazy. Single breath and just you know. He's How master. deep are they diving on those? Um, well, I I mean. I, He's he's definitely free to of super deep. I don't really I couldn't tell you exactly how much deep I'd have to ask him. Um, I would die. But, hey Joey, if you're out there listening, uh, <laughs> happy birthday because I know yesterday was his birthday. Nice. Um, but uh, but he 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 mostly dives in shallow water because okay. he lives in the Keys, so the water doesn't ever get much deeper than maybe 20 feet for right. like miles, and uh, so he he'll just sink to the bottom and on a single breath and just hang out for few minutes and and wait till he gets a good opportunity to spear fish you know holy so shit that's, that's what he does and, that's wild um, man yeah he he lives a cool life down in the keys you know he's kind of li living a little off the grid and tiny house on like a half acre and like you know awesome. spear fishes for his food and like grows all his own vegetables and everything so damn do you go visit him all that often I need to visit more. It's just when I'm home, I'm working, you know, right. and like right now, now I'm screen printing. So oh, okay. I get home and I work in the shop with my brother Okay. and um, with my younger brother. Right. And I have two brothers and a sister. Okay. So my, with my younger brother, I work in the screen printing shop. But when I get home, I'm so, I haven't, I haven't had much of a break between tours. Yeah. Cause I also play in, play in a band called house of lightning with mm -hmm. the drummer of floor. Henry. Okay. He plays guitar. He's actually an amazing guitar player. Okay. Like his drumming is, is super unique and super special yeah. and works super awesome for floor. Um, and it, but, but as like a musician, the guy's definitely a guitar player. He's like a mat. He's, he's a master riff machine, you know? Nice. He's total badass. So I play in a band. It's me, him, and Eric that just joined, oh, right joined Torch. So the three of us are in a band called House of Lightning. Um, our record just came out a couple days ago. Oh, cool. Actually. So, you know, plug for that. Nice. It's on Bandcamp, but you can check it out. It's uh, houseoflightning.bandcamp.com. It's a full-length album. Awesome. And then um, the I play in another band called Caveman Cult, which is like war, black, death metal kind of stuff, right. you know. Uh, real influenced by, like, 80s and early 90s south american and australian and uh black and death metal stuff so we so i i, I play with those guys and that's pretty much like all blast beat thrashing wow. stuff you know nonstop. and then uh that band just had a full-length record come out earlier this year crazy and we played some festivals and stuff we're gonna be playing in new york in january okay um do you know where y'all are playing i think saint vitus oh cool not that makes sense sure but i think so okay um yeah, you have to let me know, man. I'll and then out. the next, the, and then I also play in a band called Shitstorm with John from Torch and Eric, who's now playing in Torch, and okay. my younger brother, David. So okay. Shitstorm is that group of guys. And that's sort of like old Napalm Death. You know, wow. Just like tw 20 second songs. Wow. All blast beats pretty much the whole time. Um, hardcore punk kind of attitude. You know, yeah, yeah. it definitely like leans on like the earlier Napalm Death side stuff before they became death metal. So that that's another project I do. 
And then me and my brother have various projects we work on that are more experimental, you know, sure. when we're at home and we release a lot of tapes, actually. Cool. But that's just kind of more for fun. Um, whenever we do have free time, we do that. So so basically, I have no free time at all, <laughs> you know, between all the bands and everything. And I'm playing drums for Eric's other band, Wrong, now. Damn. So I'm going to be recording drums for their next record on Relapse. Um, so when I get home, I got to learn a bunch of their stuff and um i'm playing some shows with them in january which i need to figure out when in january because i'm just realizing now i have a lot of shows coming up now in january <laughs> between all the bands um, damn dude but yeah it's it's you know music i wanted music to be full-time so i i started sounds just like playing. you've done it yeah pretty much but the thing is only one band makes money and the right, rest exactly. the rest drain money from my pocket so <laughs> it's uh you know it, it is what it is I yeah. it's a labor of love and I you know I take what I make and torch and invest it in all my other bands that yeah. I really enjoy playing with so are there any uh, I guess over the 12 years is there any um, particularly ridiculous story that stands out that you'd want to relay well well the road stays on your dick. yeah <laughs> well what goes on the road stays on your dick he says yep that's true <laughs> well you know what one let's see I mean on this tour alone already we jo Jonathan almost ran over his brand new guitar. Wow. The <laughs> we he drove us to Lancaster instead of Philly. Really? <laughs> um, well, you know what? John is just basically going through what I went through ten years ago, which is the fucking crisis. Your mind just fucking loses it. <laughs> and you, yeah, things just happen. People tell you things, and then you hear differently, and then you. <laughs> Uh, Steve used to Steve used to sail sail the ship. He was kind of the captain okay, out. He 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 was the guy in charge at one point in time. And actually, I have no idea what the fuck happened. Wow. So is it just a pirate ship now? It's just one. <laughs> it, well, well. I mean, yeah. Basically, like I mean, I'm blind. So I mean, I, I I'm blind and I like to party. So I, yeah, I can't even read the fucking sentence. Really? List. Yeah, I'm actually pretty blind for real. Yeah, but he drives most of us. So. <laughs> yeah. So well, you're the driver. The the blind guy is the driver. Yeah. We we don't. We run this. Sh we we've been very lucky. Let's just say we've been very lucky that we're still alive. Hey, I, as a driver, I still drive better than everyone, as blind as I am. <laughs> right, Steve? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know how to. I can. I can back up a trailer pretty good too. Well, man. So I guess what do y'all have going on uh, after this tour? Are you going to be writing and then looking to do yet another full length for 2017 2018 yeah, 2018 we're gonna try 2018. to write it and record it next year if we can yeah. um realistically i mean the la way the labels work it'll it'll be 2018 for sure right like, even if we wrote it and recorded it next week it'd probably still be 2018 yeah um so but but the plan is to write and record demos and just work on new stuff and get a new record together and then be able to get out on tour and play the whole new record right and kind of leave a lot of our old stuff behind kind of grow as a band change our sound a little bit without not set without sounding like a different band if that mm -hmm. makes sense sure um change our image too man i think we should work out more yeah we need to work out for sure <laughs> yeah yeah you could just just do steroids and not work out at all and then yeah but steroids man i want everyone to know that i have big balls you know? right <laughs> So you don't want to shrink your big balls, yeah, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I, if I did steroids, I would tell everyone. <laughs> What's going on, man? You been working out? Dude, I'm on steroids, man. Just on steroids. Yeah. Well, I think that's about it. Yeah, I mean, all, all the bands. I mean, you can check out all the bands I mentioned on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're all on there and stuff. Um, Torch has a Bandcamp, too. You know, all the music is available. All the music. Listen. All the music, except for like any of the experimental stuff. But, yeah. but but if you look hard enough, you'll find that, too. It's not like it's a secret. You know? Gotcha. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think, like, next year, next year, every band, like, well, next year, Torch will have new stuff being written, and then I know Caveman Cult will have new, will have some new split records coming out on cool. some cool labels. One label called Invictus Productions is putting out a split with us <laughs> and an Irish band. Um, that'll be out probably in the fall next year, you know, I don't think, I don't think the recordings will be done until spring, um. But Caveman Colts playing some festivals. That band will be pretty active in the meantime while Torch is writing. Yep. And then House of Lightning's records out, so really hopefully we can get on the road too and do some stuff. Cool. That that would be the plan. Um 
I'm gonna rewrite it. I'm gonna record the the wrong record with these guys, so I'm, yes. I might be on the road with them too. If yeah. that ends up happening, if Relapse puts a record out and they get out on the road, I'll be drumming for them as nice. well. So yeah, I mean, it just seems like an, another year full of <laughs> playing in bands and touring. And um, in the me in between that, I'm gonna be at home working, screen printing with my brother, doing yeah. what I doing what I do pretty much. So, and uh, I run a mail order, but the, I'm gonna be closing up my mail order operation soon. Been doing it for. Um, like mail order brides, you mean? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I wish I wasn't that lucrative of a business. <laughs> nah, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I do like a like an extreme music mail order. Oh, like, cool. I, I, it's like a bunch of T-shirts, records, CDs, cassette tapes, and stuff. Um, nice. I've been doing it for about ten years, and uh, put out stuff for, uh, I put out some tapes and records and stuff for like lots of different kind of underground, more extreme kind of uh, acts, Stay but. Boys. Well, it's not only only noise though, you know. Some some of the bands fall more in a metal category. Uh, some of them are, you know, some of them are kind of like doom. You know, I mean, it's all brutal. Everything on it, everything, everything I've put out is brutal. But, um, yeah, the it's but fucking extreme, bro. I'm, I'm gonna be closing up. I'm gonna be closing up or closing down my online shop and try to sell my distro off to somebody because. With me being on tour all the time lately, it's been so hard to keep up with it. Now that me and my brother are running the print shop, it's like he doesn't have time to keep up keep up with mail order. Yeah. And then I've got people like writing constantly, like, "Oh, this never came in the mail." Every week there's something. It's we're just we're not doing a good job. It's like if I can't do this for real, then there's I'm not gonna do it at all. So, you know, over the, I'd say in the next month that shop will be closed, or I'll just do a sale, a blowout sale, and do everything cheap and just have the people buy it all. Might take it to shows and just do half off everything. And I, I used to take it to I used to take a distro out to shows all the time and set it up, and it was it was pretty good. And I think people pe some people started coming out to shows just to buy records from me, which is cool. I was kind of getting a little bit of a following going on in South Florida, like people that are regular customers, and if they were looking for certain things, they knew that I might get or be in touch with someone about getting you know i'd have people requesting you know like hey man I'm, i need like new record by so and so and i'd you know go out of my way to try to find it for them and stuff um we do you know the records we have some record stores in south florida but if you wanted to get into real deep underground stuff especially the tape scene and shit there's you're not going to find any of that in the record stores and people like buying stuff in person still you know i right. mean i mean internet's great and all you know mail ordering shit's great but there's nothing like being out somewhere and seeing a physical copy right there that you could pay money and take yeah. it home right there on the yeah, spot you know so i mean i still like that something about the internet it feels cheap i mean you can really find fucking almost anything if you really want to <laughs> on the internet you know if yeah. you want to pay the money for it too but yeah um nothing nothing beats finding cool things in person you know so but yeah the shop will close and then uh and then that's it man next year i'm gonna go full I mean, every year I say I'm going full force doing music shit, mm. but next year is going to be extremely full force for me, I guess, you know? I haven't really thought about it so much until now, putting it all in perspective. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. It's going to be a busy year. Yeah. I always say I'm never going to do this to myself again, and then and then here it is. Just can't stay away. Yeah, I can't. Excellent. Uh, thanks again for sitting down with me, man. It was yeah, good dude, talking was, shit I, with it, you. It was, it was a pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, good man. luck, brother. All right, y'all, that about does it for this one. Thanks uh, for tuning into the Crash Bang Boom podcast. And, of course, thanks to Rick Smith for taking the time to sit down with me. Check out Rick's mini projects and what looks like will be a really busy year for him in 2017. Uh, you'll be able to find all that info in the description area of this podcast. And until the next time, Crash Bang Boom!